Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a Q&A session with Frank Turek. He has asked about his opinion on evolution and how he would go about disproving it. Also, I would like to apologize in advance. I have a bit of a cold, so my pronunciation and inflections are a bit off, and sometimes my voice gets a little bit squeaky. But the show must go on, so let's see what he has to say. Yes, sir. What's your name? Kyle. Hey, Kyle. Go ahead. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, atheists, uh, their main point is in evolution. Like, that's what they believe. Mm -hmm. You didn't really talk about that mm -hmm. at all. So I was just wondering how or what way do you uh, disprove the theory of evolution from a biblical and scientific standpoint? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this as I want to get on to Dr. Turek, but it bears mentioning that atheism and evolution are not this inseparable couple who do everything together. There are atheists who do not believe in evolution, and there are Christians who do, though certainly there will be a higher percentage of Christians who do believe in evolution than atheists who do not. I think the reason these two concepts get so interconnected is because the atheists who are the loudest and most active also tend to talk about evolution a lot. The reason for this, though, is that they are often responding to the pushback against evolution that comes in the form of young earth creationism, which is not a position that is held by most Christians, but they are the ones being the loudest about it. Think of it this way. Dr. Mary Schweitzer is a devout Christian paleontologist, and she accepts the theory of evolution. I am a Christian. I love the Lord. My God has gotten so much bigger, the bigger I study science. Do you think she would appreciate it if I were to ask an atheist speaker to give a debunking of young earth creationism on the grounds that that's all that Christians have? That's the equivalent of what you're asking here. Okay, we have a couple of chapters in the book on that, so I'll just give you the two-minute answer. First thing, when you talk about evolution, you have to ask people, what do you mean by evolution? Here we go again. The scientific definition of biological evolution is change in allele frequency in a population over generations. That's it. So that covers both macro and micro evolution. Because the word can mean so many different things. If it means change over time, count me in. We see that. Yeah, that general definition could be applied to anything, which is why I like the specific definition about the change in allele frequency over time. If you mean microevolution, adaptation within a type, count me in, we see that. Is there a distinction between changes within a type and changes in allele frequency? I mean, since the alleles essentially control the phenotype, which is essentially the outward expression of an organism's genes, then any change between generations would be a change in allele frequency. So yeah, that fits. Now before I get crucified in the comments for lending credibility to the creationist idea of micro and macroevolution, let me just point out that these phrases were originally scientific in nature, but were hijacked by creationists to explain away the fact that evolution obviously and undeniably does happen, and is easy to see within a species. The term was originally coined by Russian entomologist Yuri Filipchenko in his 1927 book whose German name I'm not even going to try to pronounce, but which translates into English as variability and variation. They were coined in a time when evolution was still not well understood, and I would tend to agree that it's time for the terms to retire from the scientific community, as we now have a better understanding and we know that there really is no different mechanism between them, it's simply a matter of scale. But the fact remains that they are still valid scientific terms that are misused by creationists. Because the mechanisms are the same, it would be like saying a trip to the grocery store down the road is possible, but you can't possibly drive all the way across the country. The same car works in the same way to get you both to the store and to the other side of the country. It just takes longer to drive further. But if you mean molecules to man without any intelligence, count me out. Why? We know it's possible for mere molecules to turn into a person. It kind of happens all the time. When you eat, your body breaks down the molecules in the food in order to incorporate them into your body. You are quite literally made of material that at one point was never anything even close to a human being. In fact, because your body is made of about 60% water, and how the water cycle works, and how long the dinosaurs existed, that means that essentially all of the water in your body was, at one point or another, dinosaur pee. You are literally mostly made out of molecules that were once dino pee. I think I'm a bit off topic though. My point is that molecules become human beings on a regular basis, and we know the chemical reactions that would have been required to turn organic molecules into basic cells, and once you have basic replicating cells, natural selection goes to work on them. Essentially it boils down to the fact that we know all of the processes required for abiogenesis and evolution to work are possible in a natural environment, even if we haven't nailed down all the specifics. There is no reason to think that they couldn't have happened in nature because I don't think there's evidence for it. In fact, I think there's evidence against it. Let me just give you a few reasons to believe that the Darwinian, neo-Darwinian view of the world doesn't make sense. Uh, how about we start out a little bit less biased, shall we? 
Why do you need to give us reasons to believe that something doesn't make sense? Why not just present the actual evidence both for and against and let people come to their own conclusions? I know this is just a quick Q&A session, but it's possible to give an unbiased rundown of both positions. For instance, evolution is the idea that small changes can add up over time and result in big changes, which is what resulted in the diversity of life that we see today. That's evolution in an oversimplified nutshell. Young Earth creationism, in a nutshell, is the idea that Earth is about six to 10,000 years old and the diversity of life that we see today was created by God. I'd say those are both unbiased explanations. Now to add my bias back into the mix, it boils down to the idea that the kinds of changes we can observe happening today have the ability to accumulate, which makes sense, or magic. Number one, believe it or not, is the fossil record. The major body plans appeared instantaneously, virtually, in the fossil record called the Cambrian Explosion. Instantaneously is a terrible word to use here. The Cambrian explosion lasted about 20 to 25 million years. Geologically speaking, with the 4.5 billion years of the Earth's existence in mind, that's pretty quick. But to call it instantaneous makes it sound like everything just popped up all at once, which is completely false. Let's put this into terms that we can actually visualize. To drive from Halifax, Nova Scotia to Vancouver, British Columbia is a trip of 5,927 kilometers for a travel time of about 60 hours. On your way there, you stop by in Goffs, Nova Scotia to pick up a friend. Goffs is about 35 kilometers away from Halifax for about a half hour drive. Now in terms of the entire trip, this is a tiny distance, so if you picked your friend up a half hour in, you could say that you picked them up right at the beginning of the trip, or that you started the trip with them. And when looking at the whole trip, you'd be right, that was essentially the start. But when you consider the fact that we have seen speciation events occur within a single human lifetime, then to think that a whole bunch of speciation events couldn't possibly have happened over 25 million years is a joke. On our road trip, a single human lifespan of 79 years wouldn't even get us from the house to the car. Never mind the car, it wouldn't even get us out of bed. Forget getting out of bed, it wouldn't even get us to rolling over in the right direction to get out of bed. So what you are suggesting by making it sound like they all appeared instantly is that something that takes less time than rolling over to get out of bed couldn't possibly have happened a bunch of times in the time it takes to drive 35 kilometers. Um, they just pop into existence, it seems, without any fossil precursors. You're leaving out the bit where bones first developed in the Cambrian, as in the critters that existed before the Cambrian didn't have bones. Now bones are the easiest thing to fossilize, as they take a long time to decompose anyway, so there's more time for the bones to be buried in a way that is conducive to the fossilization process. So it makes perfect sense there would be minimal fossils in a period where the easy to fossilize body parts just didn't exist. This is what uh, Stephen Meyer talks about in his book called Darwin's Doubt, because this is the doubt Darwin had. He said, look, why aren't all these geological strata filled with all these intermediate uh, uh, types if my view is correct? I mean, they are filled with intermediates, or transitional fossils. It has even been successfully predicted which intermediates would be found in which layers. In fact, I'm not sure exactly which passage Darwin's Doubt is referring to, but one thing that Darwin did find puzzling was the lack of Precambrian fossils. But because of the nature of Precambrian organisms, it turns out that their fossils are actually relatively abundant even considering their lack of hard body parts. It just takes a microscope to see them because they were so tiny, so as it turns out, they're all over the place. And since there are baleen whales and toothed whales, it was predicted that a fossil would be found with both baleen and teeth. It was. Lanocetus dentacrinatus. Darwin himself, by observing a species of orchid native to Madagascar, predicted that there would be a species of moth with a proboscis just longer than 30 centimeters as a result of an evolutionary arms race between the orchids and the moths. As moths developed longer proboscises, they would be able to suck nectar from the orchids without getting pollen on them, and so would not be pollinating the orchids. This made it easier for the moth to get food, but at the detriment of the orchid, so the orchids with longer spurs to make it harder for the moths to get pollen were more successful at reproducing, which in turn pressured the moths to develop longer proboscis etc. So in 1962, Darwin first predicted the existence of a large moth with a 30 centimeter proboscis. In 1867, Alfred Russell Wallace narrowed down the prediction, stating that it would not just be any old moth, but a subspecies of the African sphinx moth, or Xanthopan morgani. In 1902, the Xanthopan morgani predicta was discovered in Madagascar as predicted, hence its name. My point is, there are several predictions that have been made because of the theory of evolution which have later been confirmed. And he said, well, if we keep searching the geological strata, one day we're going to find all these intermediate types. We've been searching it for 150 years, and we don't find that. How can you say that with a straight face? The reptile-mammal transition is well documented. The transition of whales from land animals to marine mammals was well documented. The development of hominids is well documented. And these are just the first three that came to mind instantly when thinking of transitional fossils. 
A tiny bit of googling will yield incredible results as to the number of transitional fossils that we find. And it bears mentioning that depending on how you look at it, every organism that has ever lived was transitional as evolution is a continuing process with no end goals in mind. All the examples I gave were of the transitions of some major groups, but it doesn't end at the end of that particular transition. And let's not forget all the clearly transitional species still extant today like flying snakes, squirrels and fish, walking fish, and breathing fish. Transitions are everywhere, you just have to not dismiss them with a wave of the hand to see them. Also, there's something called irreducible complexity, that things can't evolve in a gradual manner and still have function. All the parts need to be there at the same time in order to have something that's in working order. Looking for an irreducibly complex organ or system is like chasing a will-o'-the-wisp. Any system that could actually be said to be irreducibly complex, usually with a closer examination of the system, it's found that the precursor to that system had a different function. Sometimes slightly different, sometimes massively different. A good analogy for this is one that creationists usually bring up, the mousetrap. It has been said that if you so much as remove one part from a mousetrap, it will no longer function, and so is irreducibly complex. Now if you remove everything from the mousetrap except for the base plate, the spring, and the catch, it definitely won't catch mice. However, it can be used as a perfectly serviceable, if not the best looking, tie clip. The idea here is that even if a system is found to be irreducibly complex, if we insist that it retains the same function, the parts of this irreducibly complex system can always be used for different purposes. Also, there's a new discovery, relatively new, called epigenetic information, and epigenetic information is the structure of the cell. What? I'm no geneticist, but that is such a gross oversimplification that it almost made me cringe to death. In fact, I go so far as to say that's not even an oversimplification, that's just downright wrong. Epigenetics is the study of heritable phenotype changes that do not involve changes to the underlying genotype. Now I'm about to oversimplify this to the point where geneticists would still probably cringe to death, but here goes anyway. Essentially, there are environmental factors that can cause your body to change the way genetic material is expressed. One such mechanism is DNA methylation, where a methyl group is added to the DNA molecule, which can change the activity of the DNA sequence without changing the DNA itself. I'm not even sure what he means by epigenetic information is the structure of the cell. That just makes no sense. They used to think that DNA was destiny, that if you could alter DNA, you could get any body type you want. Now we know that's not true. What, because of epigenetics? It doesn't mean it's not true that an alteration to the genotype can result in a change to the phenotype. It just means there are some ways to heritably change the phenotype without directly changing the genotype. You can mutate DNA from now till doomsday, you'll never get a new body plan, because you need the structure of the body plan, not just the DNA, and DNA doesn't give you the structure. You lost me now. When DNA is read, it results in the production of a protein. Our bodies are made out of protein. DNA literally builds our bodies. I don't know how you could possibly stand there and spout such nonsense. In fact, um, you could liken DNA to a software program and liken epige epigenetic information to uh, the wood and nails and wires and cement that puts together this room. Except epigenetic changes usually result in disease, like cancer. And if you want to liken DNA to a software program, then call it a software program that controls a 3D printer. Yeah, the code itself does not actually construct anything, but it's telling the parts that do the actual construction how to do it. The software might be the or DNA might be the software that gives you the plan to create the room, but in order to create the room, you need hard materials to do so. Yeah, nobody's claiming that our bodies are made out of 100% DNA molecules. That would be silly. I don't even know where you're going with this. And DNA doesn't give you the hard materials. DNA's main function is literally to encode for proteins, the hard materials in your analogy. Just because we have found that some things can change phenotypic expression without actually altering the DNA does not mean that DNA is suddenly not responsible for the vast majority of phenotypic expression. And if you take even a tiny superficial look into epigenetics, you will find that the mechanisms work by altering how the DNA is transcribed, so it still all comes back to the DNA. I can't believe I'm even having this discussion, like are you seriously trying to debunk the idea that DNA is important to biology? I thought that was one of those things that was so basic that even creationists accepted it. Uh, there's genetic limits to change, that's another problem. Oh, here we go again. So what exactly are the limits? Be specific now, don't just say one kind can't turn into another kind, and don't think I'm not onto you using the word type instead of kind, I know you're still using the same shiftable goalpost as all the other creationists out there. Um, even using all of our 
intelligence to breed, say, different types of dogs, we can't break the genus of dogs. We run into the gen genetic limits. That's more of a limit on how the evolutionary process works than a limit on the genetics themselves. Evolution is incapable of going backward. And here I don't mean going backward like a loss of function mutation like how snakes lost their limbs. I'm talking about reverting to a previous state to try out a different design. Once a working system develops, it is far easier for further mutations to refine an already present system than to discard it and start fresh. So once the spinal cord became the dominant body plan for the chordates, it became incredibly unlikely that a series of mutations would occur that would eliminate the spinal cord and also replace it with something superior fast enough that these organisms wouldn't simply be outcompeted by their spinal corded cousins. This is how you end up with silly things like a 4.5 meter long laryngeal nerve in a giraffe, because through the evolution of the neck, the nerve became trapped under the aortic arch. This is silly enough in humans where it has to go from our brain down through our chest and then back up almost all the way to the brain again, but it makes the same detour in a giraffe, which is just ludicrous. But evolution isn't a thinking process, there was no selective pressure to redesign the system, it works well enough, so it continued. Natural selection isn't really the survival of the fittest, it's more the survival of the good enough. I don't think we should. But let me hasten to say this, let's say for the sake of argument that macroevolution is true, that the Darwinists are right, that this Darwinian viewpoint is true. Does that mean God does not exist or Jesus didn't rise from the dead? No. What's this? Am I agreeing with a young earth creationist? Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. I've been saying this for ages. Evolution doesn't threaten your religion, it just forces you to reinterpret part of it. So if you accept that evolution doesn't threaten your religion, why do you insist on denying, misinterpreting, and misrepresenting the science? So even if they're right, it doesn't affect whether or not Christianity is true. It might create problems for biblical inerrancy in the Old Testament, but it doesn't mean that God doesn't exist or Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Well, I mean, there are problems with biblical inerrancy in both the Old and the New Testament regardless of evolution, but that's another topic for another video. And let me say one last thing about this. Even if macroevolution is true, it requires God. Why? I'm gonna have to disagree with you there, but I feel like at this point you're going to start bringing up arguments that can maybe get you to deism, but wouldn't actually do anything to demonstrate the Christian God. Well, because you need a universe in order to have biological evolution. <laughs> and clearly the universe is a thing, therefore a specific Jew was crucified and turned into a zombie 2,000 years ago. Duh. And you need the, the laws of nature to be what they are to drive evolution, and that requires a mind. Do you have any supporting evidence for that claim? It keeps coming up, but I'm just not convinced of that idea. Why does it need a mind? Why can't it just be that way because that's the way it is? Or why are we not allowed to just say we don't quite know why it's that way yet, but we're looking into it? Why does it have to be God? Can you demonstrate somehow that a universe without a God wouldn't have natural laws? The answer is no. This is pretty much where he ends it, so I shall end it too. Thanks for watching and for tolerating my sniffly voice. Remember to follow me on Twitter and support me on Patreon. See you next time.